um, what type of losses? Everything, as I said, what we have in the in the Ukrainian law is just um, loss of damage to immovable property. Um, if you look at, uh, obviously, there's many, many other possible types of harm that, that may have occurred. Um, if I go back to, to UNCC, for example, it was the approach that was adopted was to identify a number of different categories of loss. And I think inevitably, when we look at reparations mechanisms, the law becomes very very quickly tied up with the procedural dimensions of how do I gather the claims? How do I verify them? How do I pay for them? And United Nations Compensation Commission was very pragmatic from the outset. It, is, it, it um, looked at a number of different types of claims. So there were claims for individuals who had to leave Iraq or Kuwait. There were hundreds of thousands of third country nationals of um, I don't know what the term is, of guest workers, particularly in, in Kuwait, that had to run away. That was a very simple category in terms of a lump sum payment, a few thousand dollars. All that was necessary was a passport, proof that you were there, not even proof that you, you fled, because the reality was it was possible that you didn't manage to get your passport stamped, but proof that you were there then different categories of loss that required progressively more onerous um, documentation and support. So personal injury, uh, death or personal injury, again, fixed sums, relatively simple documentation. But then when we got to the different categories of other types of losses, either personal or for companies, obviously we go into a far more onerous quasi-judicial process. So a need to, while determining the types of losses that should be compensated, always having in mind the, the, the procedural complexities of identifying both the victims and also reviewing the claims. Um, and then I'm going to get uh, to perhaps the, the most challenging aspect of all of this. What we've said so far is, I think, interesting. Um, it's important to bear in mind. I think the, the basis on which any possible reparation mechanism for Ukraine could be established is going to be challenging. We're obviously not going to have the Security Council establish anything. It's extremely one-sided. Ethiopia, Eritrea, there were losses and responsibility on both sides. This is an extremely one-sided <laughs> conflict. Are we going to see Russia and Ukraine through whatever type of mediation come to an agreement whereby Russia commits to make reparations? I, at present, I find that quite unlikely. So I don't think we're going to have, we're going to see an agreement between parties either. So one's left wondering, okay, how is this going to happen outside international courts? As in, I don't see a tribunal being established or a, a quasi-judicial body being established at present. But, but let's see. Obviously, there is the possibility for courts to adjudicate. But I think that the second um, point that is going to be extremely challenging is the source of the reparations. And I think it's, again, we've got to be to be very practical. It's not just the source of the funding to make the reparations, but it's also the funding with which to um, finance any claims process, because it is a significant cost. Um, I never have numbers, but uh, UNCC, it was an operation that lasted easily 15 years with, with staff, with premises, with consultants. This is a lot of money. Um, similarly, with Iran-US Claims Tribunal, that's still going. Um, 40 years later, is it the maths right? Yes, 1979, 40 years later, we're still going. So obviously, it's not just the source of the funds to actually make the payments, but the source of the funds for the whole process. Um, where have the funds come from in, in other instances? Iran, US, um, I think that there, there were frozen assets 
Iranian frozen assets in the US, US frozen assets in, um, in Iran that were pooled to cover these costs by agreement. Um, UNCC, uh, again, the, the Security Council was running the show here, a very different situation. Um, in addition to establishing the Compensation Commission, Security Council also imposed very onerous comprehensive sanctions on Iraq. Um, and as it became apparent that these were having a very significant adverse effect on the population, a mechanism was established, oil for food, that allowed Iraq to sell a specific quantity of petroleum products every year through a mechanism run by the United Nations. And a third of these funds, a third of the funds for oil for food went to UNCC. So it was very interesting in the first couple of years of UNCC's operations, this mechanism wasn't in place. And it was very difficult for UNCC to, to operate in practice. Once Oil for Food was actually established, a third of this went to UNCC. Now, um, confession, I worked for UNCC. And I have to say it was my first job um, with the United Nations. And after 18 months, I became very, very troubled because my salary was being paid out of oil for food. Funds that should have been going to the people of Afghanistan were paying me and my colleagues, our big UN salaries. <laughs> Here's my moment of confession. I, I think reparations programs are extremely important, but, and Jeff Korn isn't here today, of course, he was beside me, but whenever you think of reparations, you also say, hold on, who's being punished for this? Um, there's been a wrongdoing by, by Russia, but should it be the people of Russia that pay for it? And this is a bit what was very much what was troubling me at UNCC, I resigned. Um, but source of funds, Ethiopia, Eritrea, it was an agreement between the two parties that they would, that they would pay the compensation. Let me come back to this in a moment. There are other models. Um, I'm thinking of, for example, the German Forced Labor Claims Commission that was established, I think it was in the late 90s, to provide compensations to the victims of uh, Nazi first, uh, forced labor. And the funds for that came both from the German government, but also from the companies that had benefited from the forced labor. So innovative mechanisms. It was voluntary. Who knows? Who knows? You know, as I'm speaking, I'm going, oh, maybe that is the most promising avenue now if some of the oligarchs, some of the companies that have been um, sanctioned. So, again, these are the things to look at. Um, in terms of the of the sources of the funding in, in, in respect of the uh, the conflict today, there have been suggestions that the assets that have been frozen under sanctions could be used. So as, as all of you will have followed, one of the ways the international community has attempted to, to respond to, to, to put pressure on Russia has been the imposition of really a barrage of sanctions. Again, I'm very wary of the use unprecedented, but Ziv isn't here, so I will use unprecedented. It's really been a barrage of sanctions, and I would say in recent years, unprecedented in terms of the range of uh, restrictions that have been imposed by the number of actors, obviously not the Security Council, that have imposed such measures, and by the number of designations under financial sanctions. We've got 1,500 designated persons or entities, really quite unprecedented. But let's let's have a look at what it means to be designated for the purpose of financial sanctions. The, these restrictions have two elements. There's a prohibition on making funds or assets available to the designated persons or entities. That's usually what I talk about when I come here and I say, oh, these designations can have caused problems for humanitarian action because some of these entities are actors to whom we need to provide assistance, uh, to whom we need to provide funding in the course of humanitarian activities. I'm actually going to now flag the, the second element of financial sanctions, which is a freezing of the assets of persons or entities that are designated. 
And that's what we've all been watching with a certain curiosity, particularly in the initial months of this, all the, the, the oligarchs' properties being frozen, the yachts, where are they going, their, their bank accounts, their properties. In Angera, we, we come from the tiny, same tiny, tiny parts of northern Italy. My tiny village on Lago Maggiore, not George Clooney's like the one over, there's a lovely <laughs> um, Artico villa. And I'd noticed last summer, I was going, oh, wow, there's a fancy sports car with a Moscow number plate. How interesting. I went back um, the summer and it was all fenced off with police tape. The whole villa, Adangera. <laughs> Amazing. So, yes, we've all been watching this with a considerable curiosity. But we've got to be careful because this is a freezing of the assets. Why it's intended to prevent them from using them in order to perpet uh, to continue with the policies that the sanctions aim to to end. So the the ongoing conflict. It's intended to put pressure on the oligarchs to get them to put pressure on uh, on the on the government. It is not a confiscation of the assets. Um, so as a matter of law, it's a, the process whereby individuals are designated for the purpose of sanctions is entirely political. A state or a group of states, when it comes to the EU, adopt a broad range of grounds for sanctioning. So their support to the policies of Putin, support to the policies of Putin. That is not a legal standard for depriving someone of their liberty, sorry, of their assets, sorry. In the basis on which individuals are also selected, it's just states getting together and going through lists of persons or entities and saying, let's add them. There is a degree, a very small degree of judicial process now, ex post facto, that allows individuals who are designated to challenge the designation and to say, no, I was not actually involved in the activity that is a ground for designation. But it is very limited. And I am not sure it exists. It's got to exist as a matter of law in EU states. The extent to which it is developed in other states is still quite limited. So I am really emphasizing this point, saying, the move from freeze to seize is really not that simple. So while it might be intuitively compelling, hey, there's been massive violations, we need to make reparations, and here are these colossal amounts of money that are frozen, surely we can use them for this. No, as a matter of law, it's far more complicated than this. I think that the analysis is different depending on whether we're looking at government funds. So funds or assets that belong to, to Russia, and the funds of private individuals and entities. I, I, have, I just think the challenges are different. I think when we're looking at government uh, funds, there's questions of, um, of immunity before domestic processes, judicial and administrative. You can't just seize government's property through a, um, in a legal proceedings. And I think, again, when I, when I look at the individuals, there are significant considerations in terms of protection of right to property. So while compelling, while intuitively intriguing, it's really not going to be that easy. Um, and then my penultimate point, um, and I get quite passionate about this, reparations to whom? All too frequently, reparations mechanisms are empty promises when it comes to the actual victims of the violations. Ethiopia Eritrea Claims um, Commission, the, the claims process, it, there was adjudication at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague for a number of years, interesting decisions handed down by an eminent judicial panel, awards um, made. Guess what? The two states said, "You, I owe you X, you owe me Y. Let's go. We're fine. Let's just call it a day. This is even though a number of the claims related to violations suffered by individuals. So the individual victims saw nothing of this. And I had problems with UNCC, but what I find amazing was 
on a number of occasions, two, possibly three. I don't know which way to point. In Jordan, which way should I point? <laughs> that way. I was in Jordan. Um, and I might speak to my taxi driver, what what do you do? And I say, oh, I, I work for the UN. This is after I left UNCC. And the guy would turn around to me and go, the UN? I was living in uh, Kuwait. I ran away. The UN gave me money. Like... They couldn't believe it, but here was a successful climate. So for all its shortcomings, UNCC did deliver the funds to the actual victims of violations. There was a recent case before the International Court of Justice, um, Uganda DRC, that got to the reparation stage. Again, I'm not good with numbers. Reparations were awarded to Uganda 2022 the word victim, the, a, a nudge by the International Court of Justice, even though we're looking at the supremely traditional interstate mechanism of litigation be, before the International Court of Justice, there was not a nudge in the judgment that, hey, Uganda, when you get the money, perhaps think of giving it some of it to the individual victims. And again, this is even though the actual litigation referred to violations suffered by a number of individuals. There's a little line in the separate opinion of Judge Yusuf kind of saying, you know, it would be nice if some of the individual victims received funding. So it, it's still, I, I would say in all of the, the others are challenges. I'd say huge challenge in terms of the mechanism for setting up any form of reparation mechanism. Significant challenge in terms of where the funding is coming from. And, you know, as I was speaking, I was going, well, German False Claims Commission, industry, maybe some of these oligarchs out of the kindness of their heart might set something up. Who knows? You know, <laughs> let's, right. let's dream. But I think what would be completely, to me, unacceptable in, in 2022 would be if the individual victims of the violations and in particular the violations of of um, IHL, where it is the individuals who suffer, were not to see anything. I'm going to conclude with some breaking news. Monday, whenever that was, the General Assembly adopted a resolution. It's just a General Assembly resolution. Furtherance of remedy and reparation for aggression against Ukraine. On this very topic, um, <clears throat> where it says, recognizes that the Russian Federation must be held to account for any violations of international law in or against Ukraine, including its aggression, as well as any violations of IHL and human rights law. And OP3 recognizes the need for the establishment in cooperation with Ukraine of an international mechanism for reparation for damage. So here it is, it's just a General Assembly resolution, but this is what we have, um, and it is saying that we need to establish an international mechanism of some sort. And then um, <clears throat> what it does, the next um, paragraph recommends the creation by member states in cooperation with Ukraine of an international register of damage to serve as a record of evidence and claims information on damage. Empty promises. <laughs> is an international register of damage something we're familiar with here? Um, yes. And unfortunately, that falls into the empty promises um, side of the conversation on reparations so far. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Manu. And we open it for Q&A. We have Amnon and then... Thank you very much um, for this uh, new discussion of all problems. <laughs> um, so, so I have several, I think, points or, or comments um, that I think we should address at this point, because I do think that the, the, the initial question is, what is it? Or is, is, there, is there an opportunity to rethink all the problems here? Yeah. You touch upon several several uh, such opportunities. Uh, I, I think perhaps with your permission, spend on some. So I think the initial question is what type of a regime are we invoking here? And 
And traditionally, you would be thinking, of course, on a bridge based or fault based regime where you have to establish a breach of public international law. And then, following from that breach, there are consequences, some of which may be criminal, including ICC, not ICC, doesn't matter, criminal. Others are civil, but they follow the logic of fault based regimes. Now, interestingly, when those kind of things actually work is when you skip over that stage. So you kind of say, and that's 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 classic dispute resolution analysis that Deborah uh, uh, is familiar with. That sometimes it's important to assume responsibility, or but but then but then there's a different mechanics for that. It's a kind of a pusillanimity issue where you dislodge. The actual sanction for the sanction of responsibility in a PhD student mind actually works for the for the Israeli foreign office. His name is Itai up there. His PhD is that this is exactly what you should be doing. You should you should say if you if you know the process with first of all you have to assume you have to prove legal responsibility for each and every violation, the resistance you're gonna get is so insurmountable. That down the line you're not going to get any. You're not going to get anywhere. So, so you should rethink the logic differently and think about it as I don't want to say insurance against because this is taking it too far, but the compensation from the stemming from principles of mutual responsibility or something akin to basic principles of public are somewhere there, or it could be developed. But, but rather than skipping the fault base, uh, so, so maybe this could be. An opportunity to say, look, whatever it is, but the people of the people of Ukraine, you know, you don't have to have them run through the notion yes. of every, yes. you have to prove each and every. Problem. That's point number one. That's a problem for a regime. And how do we develop such a regime? What are the mechanics? The mechanics. I agree with the procedures and mechanics could be then thought accordingly. But that point is, is I think, on the table. The second point that relates to this is. What are we compensating, compensating for? So you've mentioned the initial issue of whether it's real estate, i.e. immovables versus others, but I think there's an initial question. Do we, do we compensate for public or private? It is, what about rehabilitation of infrastructure? So here we have a big, I think a big question on the table that I think the current regimes do not necessarily Address in you know now of course there are some examples and we can think about some examples, uh, but again comprehensively I think we have an opportunity here to contribute to a systemic way of thinking. What do we do with the massive destruction of public infrastructure that it, that was part of the Russian war effort was directed at that? So we have to think about what do we do with that. Um, and again. It's just an invitation for it's, you know, for the discussion. The, the last two points I want to raise: one has to has to do with um, the notion of, um, in that respect, the notion of the source of the funding that you raise. I think rightly so. Something that we should consider. Now, so we can apply, and then the question is a methodological, methodological question: How should we think about that? Should we adopt a real politics IR international relations approach, or should we go <laughs> jurisprudence and say what are the legal principles that should? So, so, and again, it's it's, it's a big question because when we get to the real, real politics of it, then we can have a wonderful system in the books, but but yeah, yeah. it's going to remain on the books. So, if you think about it in real politics, I think actually the what you mentioned that the oil for the oil for food, uh, if, if there's any I think that to the extent Europe decides that it wants to re-establish a economic relationship with Russia, I'm not sure if it would, but it does, then you can definitely say, well, to the extent you keep exporting energy to us, there's going to be a certain surplus of that energy, because we already have the, the, the footprints of that type of regime. Yes. Um, you know, it, it, in a reality way, it's like, this money we're not going to buy. I mean, it's not money that we're going to engage with any 
any, unless a cut is being diverted to the Ukraine, and, and from the Russian perspective, okay, you don't have to pay this tax to, uh, to, to Russia as part of re-entering uh, Europe. It might, uh, uh, but again, yeah. once you move to money, then you use the oligarchs in a way just to facilitate it because they would, they would be able to facilitate it. But I think, I think from an IR perspective, can you, can you justify it for, jurisprudentially as a way of, that? why would you think mm -hmm. about it? Exactly, we should think about it. It has to be legal containers, I think about this, but I think that if you approach it with a direction from this direction, it's not it's not, it's not so inconceivable to me to say, you know, it's beyond the reach of, of, of our imagination to think that there's I nowhere to take this to take this from. And the last point I want to address is the point that uh, mm -hmm. the point that you raise with so many individuals. Because I think I think at the end of the day, it's about it's also about the people, it's about the individual individual. And here, and, and here, I think you're absolutely right if you rely to national law. It's a wrong way to think about it. Here, our experience, actually, we have engaged in that in the nerve center, was to address domestic law, to address municipal, municipal infrastructure, legal infrastructure. In Israel, for example, we are, we, we are reflecting it for bad reason, for good reason, but we're very polished and experienced in, in a tax system that has, so the state of Israel pays to, to the extent rockets are launched. Yes. And so, so there's a whole mechanism yes. that the tax authority, the first person who would actually get to a, to a damage, how would be a person from the tax, really? from the tax, wow. tax from the, from the tax uh, authority, and they will document everything that was damaged, and there's a record, and in fact, <laughs> So when you rebuild, they will also deduct something because you say you upgraded, you upgraded. now you have a better house, so we have to deduct something. And they're very tax people, right? They have their tax logic, it's very, they're very efficient, but, and you have a whole regime around that. So I think here, in a, in a, in a way, we can learn from, public national law is not designed to do that, we should invoke domestic systems, and we can and we can hear transportation might work. Here, transnational transportations might work because this jurisdiction may have experience, like Israel may have experience on that. Why do you have to have the evidence now? So, if, if you do anything with respect to this new resolution, is to tell Ukrainians, to the Ukrainian locals, that you yeah. document, you document, yeah. you document now, because whatever. Yeah, so much to them. I know. But, 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 we, but not, not, but it's being done in a way to, to make sure that Russians will pay, that, that Russia will pay. I'm not sure that when it comes to private individuals, everything should come, because this, this, this raises the problem uh, that you mentioned before, that there's a skew if it comes only from one pocket. Um, in an interesting way, if citizens of Russia near the border zones, were also negatively impacted to the extent the fund is designed in a meaningful way. If we care about the people, we don't care about punishing, or it's not about punishing, we care about the well being of it. It can be a way of reconciliation to think about also Russian citizens that, that they don't actually like Putin, but we don't care whether they like Putin or not. But they say, well, they suffered, and their houses were also destroyed. Uh, so, so we should think about using those mechanisms at the domestic level in a way that it is meaningful. How to do it and how to tie the funds from the international to the domestic. Yeah, yeah. There should be something about that. These are the four fronts that I think are opportunities. I mean, we have challenges, but there's opportunities to think about them in a way that it can maybe move us forward. I hope it's helpful. No, it's brilliant. Can I just. Um... Who's chair? Not me. You don't. You don't. is the boss. We, we, he knows how to manage it. He <laughs> used to his followings. And then that, that's, um, that's brilliant. Um, and I suppose I mean, your first point reminded me that I should have said at the outset, obviously there's also the potential of reparations through any ICC process. I, I'm not an expert in that. I'm so, the, so I actually looked into that in a, yeah. in, it worked terribly in Africa. It worked terribly. Actually, it raised expectations. 
and the victims were there and they were told if you if you only testify you can also get something um, out of that terrible yeah terrible yeah. there's a work like the Berkeley clinic it's, it's like it's a it needs there's scope for improvement yeah. um in terms of um the the having to to prove that everything was a violation of of the law obviously there's the overarching violation of your sad bellum and if you look at uncc what it did was essentially say let's, any, skip. let's skip it let's skip it we start off with there's this violation of international law and then it's a question of causation these type of losses that arise as a direct result of the invasion and occupation of so that was that's exactly what what was done um, for the reasons you give. And then um, as you were speaking, I was saying, oh, I had a question. Doesn't Israel have a system for expiration payments payments um, for the rockets, but also when it causes damage? Um... So here, the, no. here's where you see this cue. <laughs> okay. Because there was a system, oh. and then the state legislated against it. Oh. So there was a system whereby unintentional damage yeah. that was not part of a direct war effort, but was just a negligent cause of negligent. I don't even, uh, that was common law, I believe, but it was just uh, it was It was part of common law, but, but it was codified under... Well, no, it's still the law, but they have an exemption for yeah. war type. No, uh, not, that, that, the codification is, is, is the exemption, but I well, think before... Well, the initial uh, one is the codification of British, oh, yeah. so we have to talk about it's the codification of British law, uh -huh. and then... Which said, if the, if the state, you know, did something outside of, of, of its duty to its own citizen, but you can claim that there should be access to claims here. But then, as the as the, the situation with Palestinian, uh, Palestinians became uh, entangled in such a way, the state wanted to extricate itself, and then it's legislated in two ways. One, with substantive law saying, um, um, we switch from the the, uh, the the initial conduct to a, a geographical definition, and if in this in this area there are any type of war efforts going on, then the entire area is exempt from any state liability of Israel. And the second, maybe it procedurally makes it impossible for people from, the, from let's say Gaza to come to Israel and, 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 sue. and sue because we make it through procedures. So so it's is there an example of what could be and then what shouldn't be? <laughs> well, in one. Yeah, okay. We have uh, some more examples, but... <laughs> oh, right. but yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I, I, I love the idea of the, the tax on the exports. That's, that's exactly it. So that's, that's a phenomenal idea. And there's a group of academics that are involved in thinking of ideas so the moment i finish here i'm going to text them that the yes, unknown um, idea of course, yeah. of course there, there is a there is a book here i'm not gonna i'm gonna shut up after this it gives a wrong incentive to europe because europe should actually not become rehooked on the russian oh, yes. but you know it's a question of then you know the list of people yeah. or something but yeah yeah, but are we looking at alternative energy? Yes, yes. No. If I mean, they're not competing on an equal footing with others, other countries, maybe it's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In terms so, of trade. So there's a lot of things that I mentioned. I mean, I'm a long society scholar, so for me, uh, in analysis of iterations, it was very interesting. So two quick questions, uh, and I will be very brief. Firstly, you know, once you were talking, I mean, above your wonderful Italian, I mean, when you say the names of the cities in Italian, <laughs> it's wonderful. But I was envisioning, um, which is too late for Ukraine, unfortunately, um, an international system of insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the sources might be international organizations. So why not to think more carefully, conceptually and practically about the international system of insurance? <clears throat> because the Russians would not pay. Uh, the only country who is going to pay, and this is my second question, is obviously the United States. Uh, and my question, because we are talking about trillion of dollars, so might be also some assistance with Germany, but no other country can pay damages in trillions of dollars. And my question is, 
why not to envision, and this is the first question is more at the conceptual level, and the second one is very practical, a sort of a revised Martian, Marshall plan, which worked for Germany. Um, I think the analogy to the Holocaust survivors, it's more problematic because part of that is paid by uh, German taxpayers. Uh, so here it's, it's different. So th those are my two questions about insurance and about a sort of a revised Marshall plan. Because I don't see any other source for paying that amount of money for rebuilding Ukraine. Basically, we are talking about rebuilding the whole Ukraine. And, I mean, it's, okay, um, I am a bit troubled by the insurance suggestion because we are in, insuring against violations of international law. It's, I, it, I just find it ethically problematic. It's like saying, you know, oh, you can now claim compensation for, from torturers. Can they get insurance so that if they <laughs> torture and then end up before a court, the insurance will pay for it. So I'm, I'm a bit troubled uh, as to the the approach of insurance. Who's going to pay for the reconstruction? I, I think here, you're right, we're, we're looking at essentially, the kind of damage we're looking at is both a question of a desire to responsibilize Russia for the damage it has caused, but also a need to rebuild the critical infrastructure of this country. Yeah. And it's a similar conversation to what's been coming up in, in Syria in different ways. There's no conversation about reparations there but the, and the conversation is slightly different it's about the scope of the except uh, it's about what states are willing to fund and stay and the kinds of activities that they're going to allow under sanctions so again back to sanctions and it's very interesting to see that while states are willing to say we will fund obviously humanitarian obviously rehabilitation so you can see you know but the conflicts calm down and there's damage that is necessary for meeting basic needs and they call it rehabilitation but you see states digging their, their heels in when it comes reconstruction there's a the former british permanent rep to the to the um to the security council is this amazing woman and she goes um the uk taxpayers are willing to to, to fund humanitarian action the russian taxpayers can pay for reconstruction <laughs> So it's a bit those dynamics. And here's my my ignorant question. I went to an, an international school in the early 70s. We pretended the Second World War hadn't happened. Otherwise, <laughs> it was going to be tense. Where did the source of the um, Marshall Plan funds come from? The US government. The US, the US government. government. Oh, yeah. The opposite, yeah they, did. they said, let's reverse the side. I was just we, thinking of that. The side, we tax them. We're going to pull them. We're going to completely we're going to pull money wow. they're by buying them buying them into our system making them buy into our system our economic system and we have a new world order where u.s capitalism is, is basically wow. uh, the time can i pick up on the new on the marshall plan uh so there's a lot of work being done uh within the european commission on that point already uh I think it's in, I'm double checking my data here. So it's in cooperation with the World Bank, European Commission, and obviously the, the government of Europe. There's already a division of Ukraine into zones and which countries will focus, which will focus where uh, on the building and the construction. Um, and I think the idea reflects pretty much the Marshall Plan. So uh, I think there is little hope about getting substantial funds from Russia in a foreseeable future. But given the dependence of many European countries and maybe even the EU as such on Ukrainian grain and many other basic food products, there is a very interesting need of the EU to rebuild Ukrainian infrastructure very quickly. Um, and this is already slowly, I mean, there are plans for that. Obviously, it's not put in place yet because there are still active facilities in many of these zones. Uh, but there are already plans in place of who would do, will do, would do, and who will do what. Uh, and then, again, look, which is really interesting. And then I was looking at the source of funding to be creative. Obviously, the companies that get these awards for reconstructions make a lot, a lot of money. Yeah. It is a business as any other. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, and, but I'm thinking about the reparation. 
It's like these companies are benefiting from the fact that they need to repair, can reconstruct. They weren't responsible for it, but they're benefiting. No, so, so the, here the logic is that there would have to be a, some inter, transnational, so a German, yeah. some German companies will also participate in the journey will be able to fund its economy by German companies doing exactly. it. But the, but, the, but the labor will come from Ukraine. So, so again, the question now is whether China will be part of that because we might need Chinese capacity to rebuild. I can I have an answer for that as well. Within the European plan, at least, uh, there is an option for partnerships with with uh, Chinese uh, corporations, but there is no no envisioned version of a plan in which the Chinese government yeah, no, 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 jumps in. But yeah. there is an option to include the Chinese yeah, yeah. corporations because of the capacity to, to to build quickly very essential infrastructure, which we yeah, simply lack in Europe. Yeah. And China might change its position on the world. Just thinking. Yeah. Always a question mark. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is really fascinating. And I think that uh, my first uh, comment was actually uh, really follows from Amnon and Gadi. Um, so I'm just going to make it uh, quickly. It, it follows mostly, mostly from the insurance point. And, you know, in terms of international law, I'm not entirely sure that I'm as uncomfortable as you are with this idea of insurance. I think that if you take torture, that's okay, use Kogan's violation, et cetera. But if it's if it's about uh, you know public infrastructure and so forth, I'm not so sure that uh, the moral hazard should be the the, the the fundamental issue here. I think there is a kind of pragmatist interest to um, rebuild. And if the US can do it and then raise the debt against Russia in some way, and so, so it keeps the debt, um, and it keeps the the the, the, uh, liabi the, the liability loop, uh, remains with Russia, but now the claimant against Russia is the U.S. as a public entity. I don't think that's so bad. Yeah. Um, and I have another one, uh, which is yeah. that I think we have moved in the conversations the conversation from a legal discussion of reparations to a more economic discussion of development policy, essentially. Yeah. And I, I think that the, the, the moment we talked about Marshall Plan and, and return to Versailles was very, very uh, interesting in that regard um, because it is a move in economic theory, essentially to Keynesianism and to the idea that if we pour money, we create value. Pour money on you, uh, okay. So within this picture, when we think of it as a development question and not a reparations question, I think another piece of the puzzle will be, um, and now I move to the issue of refugees, the temporary protection directive and how long it stays in force in Europe for the Ukrainians. Because the Ukrainians in fact have in economic terms already gained a certain, sorry to say this, benefit um, by get, gaining access to free access to the European market, um, for three years of visa, and then also a lot of forms of support. And I think that as we go forward, we are already seeing this now, the mood in Europe will be to, short, to, to end this and not to allow this to remain forever. And then it will become a question whether it is economically beneficial for building Ukraine to allow Ukrainians to continue to work in Europe. Um, uh, yes. In Germany, it's already changing. Um, and I think the more this happened historically with every refugee crisis, initially there's a big response, a big kind of uh, welcoming response. And then if the conflict remains protracted, people start to ask the question, when are these people going back home? This happened in you know many many historical examples, and then it also becomes an economic question: what, Is it worthwhile for us to allow them to work here, and then they'll travel back, maybe a little bit more wealthy, or uh, do we want to end end this? And all these questions come kind of fall into one puzzle when we move from the rep legal reparations discussion. Can I just, can I, uh, just a follow up, do you have any statistics on the distribution of Ukrainian refugees in the United States? Like which states? Yeah, I mean, I don't have them off. Uh, yeah, but what's Yeah, they're, they're available, yeah. Eurostat. I mean, you go online, you, you see it very, very simply. But very important. 
Yeah, that's why I was asking. <laughs> no. And then the argument that Poland was already open for like 10 years for Ukrainians, and I don't really see this I, 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 change I, of attitude. No, no, I, 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 uh, Ukrainians received visa uh, yeah, EU wide. But, yes, but yes. this is tiny bit, yeah? This is comparing, that's why I ask about statistics, okay. comparing with other influxes of immigrants. I think this is somehow different because of many reasons, not only of the of the uh, ongoing conflict, but also the socialization and. Can, can I have one ignorant question? The impression one gets is that Ukrainians want to go or not, and also the level, the the and quality of life. Wants to go mm -hmm. home. I don't know. I, I they're very patriotic at the moment, and it's again the level. The impression I get of the level, the quality of life, the level of economic well-being between Ukraine and neighboring states, or and the life they're currently living, is it such that people are going to say, "Why should I go back to to, to Ukraine? My quality of life is so much better here." And then a legal question: membership of the EU. That's yeah. none of this membership of the EU. The whole question of I eat refugees. I can think both. Um, the Polish Border Guard publishes monthly statistics on the number of people crossing each way. Uh, so there was a time during the summer when the, the facilities quieted down a little bit, at least in the in the west of Ukraine, and we could see that there were months where more people, more Ukrainians at least were leaving Poland than going into Poland. So there there is a tendency, I would say, when things quiet down on the eastern front, that uh, people want to go back. Uh, how many of them keep going back and forth? It's impossible to know at this point. Uh, as, on the, as for the EU membership, I think it's obviously a political decision. I, I'm afraid there will be plenty of promises because it's pol politically beneficial at this point, but it's, it's, but it's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. Uh, and there is plenty of legal, I wouldn't say guidance, but there is an inclination within the EU not to take in any more countries without clarified boundaries, uh, not boundaries, uh, borders issues. And this is a major one. Uh, and as long as there is as there's any occupation in Eastern Ukraine, that's just not going to happen. So until Ukraine has stable border in the east, that's uh, never going to happen. That's why I'm saying it's so not going to happen. I, 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 I'd, say, I'd say that it's not quite so clear that it's never going to happen, but it's also not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen soon. That's for sure. So I, I guess the but just the, uh, okay. Sorry. So, want you first, have more questions. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, don't, don't I have a very meta question, uh, actually, so not related to Ukraine and Russia conflict, and it's a question about whether or not composition mechanisms are actually a good solution uh, for a conclusion of a conflict, because especially in conflict when there's so such difference in narrative of why this started, who's to blame, and and then I'm also like my next kind of like train of thought is like, are we trying to create a sustainable like peace afterwards? You know, and and I and it takes me to Israel and Palestinians and and thinking of whenever this conflict ends, like how to really approach the question of, of compensation and whether or not you want to legalize it in terms of like coming and proving your claims in front of a court when you know historic records have been you know long, long gone. So it's, a, it's an overreaching question of this mechanism as a whole. I don't know if it's this uh, discussion, but uh, I think we yeah, should have it. Well, I, I think it's an interesting com conversation, and, and um, I suppose it, it ties in with who establishes the, the reparations mechanism. And at, at present, there's a significant call for it, is it? just because of the, 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 the evident unlawfulness of what's happened and the suffering of the people. So, it's somebody that we've the, 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 the narrative of Western pushing Russia further and further away and I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so uh, that's not irrelevant to, to the question of uh, of the unlawfulness of the act. Whether I think it would be interesting because it, I am just wondering, and it's not something I've looked at. I think there's been considerable discussion of personal accountability and its impact on peace. I don't know to what extent there's been a similar analysis of the effect of reparations mechanisms. I mean, I, 
the particular this particular context is sweet generous on this front as well i'd say and i, I don't know whether beyond return and compensation I mean, presumably here the focus is on return and compensation for property principally or much more than that, much more than that. <laughs> I, I was wondering in the seven, 75 years uh, of Israeli-Palestinian conflict, was there any legal proceeding of reparation, international law channel? So, um, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there is a very interesting uh, history on this in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whereby um, a, a German Jewish look, look I, I actually wrote a paper about this, uh, a German Jewish lawyer named Leo Cohen um, came up with an idea to um, account for all the losses that Palestinians had here against the losses that Jews had in Middle Eastern countries, and to yeah. <laughs> and then and, 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 and then to have like two accounts that uh, offset each other. And of, of course, there are remaining claims that Palestinians have against uh, Israel and the Jews have against, for example, Egyptian authorities and in the uh, Camp David agreement with Egypt, it was part, there is a, a, a provision there, there is a provision there that um, one day we will have a claims commission to, to, to have, this was never done, this was never um, applied, and we have also um, a piece of law that I believe is from, um, I don't remember, but I, I think it's from 2015, that uh, um, requires the Israeli government when it has peace with yeah to uh with 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 arab countries and iran to include the reparations issue for jews uh that came from those countries so yeah, uh all this is uh, you know uh, theoretical theoretical and but actual actual legal proceedings or mechanism between israel and uh, domestic, domestic law. Domestic, yeah, domestic, yeah, yeah. domestic law. I know it's a very efficient system, but no, 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 <laughs> in, 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 in general outlines. Okay. If I, uh, just, just a two ah. because we have a student also at Korea, and then we have students okay. on Zoom, and then... Okay, uh, thank you. Thank so you for your uh, presentation, okay. first of all, and... and collect them, and then... Yeah. Okay. Regarding what Adam said, actually, I think it's also a matter of feels, building, like, having a sense of closure that probably also imposes to think about who is actually giving compensation to whom that has to be taken into consideration, otherwise the underlying conflict won't be solved anyways. But the actual question that I wanted to ask is when you mentioned yes, that right. you found for reparations uh, in uh, forced labor during World War II, of course I thought about the Fabini case, the Fermini case. I don't know. No, okay. So this was uh, okay for also for everybody else yeah. who's not Italian who didn't probably study this case, but <laughs> it was uh, this man Ferrini asked for repression to Germany because he was um, uh, during the war he was uh, Ferrini yes uh, F E R okay he was uh, he suffered for forced labor during World War Two because of the Nazi regime and actually the answer given by the German state was that it was a matter of um, state. No, it was a uh, next <laughs> uh, 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 So it was not Jure Gestionis. There was there, there, therefore there was no reason for the German state to give compensation to this person. This act is uh, this yeah this they thing went on and, and all, yeah there was an immunity of the state. It went on for. Forever, the situation is not completely settled because the Italian constitutional court keeps saying that Ferrini was right. And but that's the thing that made me think about the fact that when you have a domestic compensation system, doesn't it rely too much? Doesn't it rely too much on the willingness of a certain state where the compensation is should be given, should be provided? 
to actually provide this compensation. Isn't it too biased in a sense? We want to collect questions. Okay. Otherwise, <laughs> we won't make it on time today. Yeah. So we have a question from a student. Yeah, please I unmute and ask. Let's unmute first. I think you can also unmute. No. Oh, yeah, probably the microphone is far away from yeah, her yeah, yeah. and the computer as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. she made it. Hi, uh, my name is Me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the lecture. I uh, just, just wanted to ask um, when you uh, talked about the sanctions that were um, operated upon um, all kinds of actors uh, in Russia and Russia itself. Um, did you also um, examine the um, results of those sanctions on the uh, Russians in Russia? Because uh, here in Israel, there are lots of uh, new uh, Israelis <laughs> came from Russia uh, in the past uh, six months, and they uh, chose to uh, leave Russia because uh, in Russia, there was a big um, poverty, lots of poverty, and a lack of uh, medicines and all kinds of uh, um, social um, uh, infrastructure that was uh, uh, <laughs> conflicted because of those uh, sanctions, international sanctions. Uh, so when you say refugees, you mean only the Ukrainian but uh, there are also uh, Russian refugees uh, and they are um, conflicted not by the war itself, but uh, by the only the sanctions that were conflicted upon uh, Russia uh, since the beginning of the war. Um, is there any kind of uh, um, something that adjusted to that? Uh, problem in your study? Are we collected? Okay. <laughs> My English is really cool. Sorry. Oh, no, no, it was very clear. Very clear. Good question. I... Yeah. Uh, Ellie? Okay. No, answer uh, Julia. And, uh, sorry, what's your name? We didn't get it. Me? Yeah. It's Amy. Amy? Amy? Oh. So, um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. The, the, your, I, I am not sure. I quite understand your question about is the court, the domestic court, not likely to be biased? But I suppose here it's going to be Ukrainian mm -hmm. courts that are likely to hear the cases, and I suspect the dynamics are likely to be that they're going to award the compensation. The dynamics are probably rather different to but then again it, you you will fall into the problem of having a sense of closure and uh, like in a uh, you know after yeah, no 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 i i agree i i understand what you're saying and i think they're just two different conversations uh they're not two different it's the same conversations but they're just two different streams of of approaches and i think that if a case were to appear before a, a ukrainian court it probably the sense of closure, its desire for closure would be closure is if there's reparations. So I'm, close, exactly. <laughs> I'm not an IRA specialist, but I suspect if you ask them what closure would be, it would be that. Um, when it comes to case law, I think that it was interesting to see that the, the most recent round of programs for World War II reparations were actually prompted by litigation in the states, mm -hmm. um, there was a number of cases, particularly against Switzerland for the gold, but in the U.S., I think for the the forced labor. That's right. So exactly, it, it, they happened pretty much in the same couple of years, and I would say that the fear of litigation in the U.S. and multiple litigations and huge awards is very much what prompted the German government and the various companies to establish mm -hmm. this um this uh this voluntary scheme and i'm sure that there's also some kind of link to preventing further litigation and as i hesitate as i say it 
but I'm, I am pretty sure there is. There was the previous arrangements for compensation. So there, there must, yeah. Um, Emmy, so on, on the sanctions front, careful, I'm even more passionate about sanctions than about reparations. <laughs> so um, we, we've got to be, no, I've got to look at you there. Sorry. We've got to be careful. Russia as a country is not under sanctions. No one has adopted comprehensive sanctions against Russia. Significant sanctions have been adopted against in terms of particular sectors of the Russian economy, defense, maritime, oil industry, telecommunications, aviation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> significant um, financial sector sanctions have been imposed. I don't know what I'm talking about. Limiting the capacity to invest and engage in the capital markets. Number of Russian banks have been taken off the SWIFT mechanisms, but alternatives have been found. And then I'm um, yes, a lot of targeted financial sanctions are imposed on 1,500 individuals and companies. So these have intentionally been targeted sanctions. So, and I'm talking about sanctions here. I'm not talking about the, the multitude of companies that have decided, hey, we don't want to work in Russia anymore. That's that's their voluntary decision. So I think that, that states, the EU and uh, the US and the UK have attempted to impose sanctions that are targeted and that hurt the targeted individuals rather than have a broader impact more generally. I'm always reluctant to, to, to venture into the humanitarian impact of sanctions. I mean, I, I can say yes, the, the UN sanctions on Iraq had a colossal humanitarian impact, but that's why we moved away from comprehensive sanctions to targeted sanctions of the nature that have been imposed now. Um, I tend to focus on the impact on humanitarian action. So saying, do these sanctions impede the capacity of humanitarian actors to operate? And there, when you said, hey, the refugees are not just Ukrainian refugees, there's also humanitarian impact in Russia, and there's also refugees, Russian refugees fleeing, I agree with you. And definitely when it comes to humanitarian action in Russia, as I said in, in Jerusalem, we're not there yet. We're not there yet because it is political. And for example, the EU has adopted exceptions saying, oh, should any of these targeted sanctions cause problems for humanitarian action, there's an exception for humanitarian action in Ukraine. Now, I know that there's humanitarian actors operating in Russia that have problems with some of the designations. In my example is Sberbank, which is like the Leomi of, um, of Russia. And humanitarian actors need to make payments for rent, for internet, to their staff through this bank. So payments to, de to normal individuals who are not designated and can't. The Russian Red Cross uses Sberbank. It was just a commercial bank. And at present, these payments are not covered by the European the exception in European sanctions because it only covers response in Ukraine. You go and speak to the 27 member states, and they say, oh, must you really respond to in Russia? Is it really necessary? So immediately here we have sanctions running up against the politics. And, and, and it's a long way around, I mean, to say, I hear you in terms of a certain narrative of who the victims are. We don't have time. And I, 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 thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, it was wonderful because it was very informative and for me it was very really surprising because as you know our in the conversation you know we never think about this in terms of internet compensation or reparation mechanism in international law uh, and because we do it domestically but I, I think your talk really raises a lot of uh, theoretical and conceptual issues you know Lena's point is that why the innocent Russian citizen who fled Russia because she lost her job in the airport uh, should not be compensated like an uh, uh, innocent Ukraine who lost his house. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think what, what your talk proved is really that this is an area in which 
the law in the books and law in action is really the gap is too broad to uh, actually get and eventually any kind of economic plan uh, should think about the principles and not about the actual values of proceedings and institutions. I think the principles are individual justice as much as can, can be done. Uh, you know, the macroeconomics perspective, the, pub, the public infrastructure and uh, restoring Ukraine. Uh, and third is minimization of transaction costs. Uh, because all these mechanisms that you proposed, as you said, will cost a lot of money. Um, I think that some kind of you know, plan that will min minimize these transaction processes not will be a court decision, but really an administrative or bureaucratic decision uh, uh, should, should be taken on board as well. Ellie, I, as you can see, I, I agree about um, minimizing the transaction costs. As you can tell, it pained me from when I was, <laughs> I think I was 28 and I was pained. Um, with just my, my comment, my reaction of the compensation for the, I agree, innocent Russians who lost their job, I think as a matter of law, the line's going to have to be drawn somewhere in terms of the, the reverberating effects of the violate of Russia's invasion attacks and invasion. Yes, uh, they because of Russia's invasion and the pullout from the Russian economy. Now the reality that lots of people were not flying there anymore. This person was forced to leave. It's a reverberating effect, and at some point, the line needs to be drawn. And I'm thinking back a on UNCC and I, it was arising as a direct result of the invasion of Iraq, not of the invasion of Kuwait at that time. <laughs> um, it would be interesting to see where it drew the line at, at direct and I'm sure that there is jurisprudence there. Again, as a matter of law and you were talking about the inherent justice, which is not necessarily the same. I think unfortunately the venues of proceedings is not something we can avoid. I think to the extent that people are going to appear before the courts, in Ukraine, in the US, that's that's just going to, to happen, whether or not it's the ideal forum. Again, as a matter of... <coughs> um, uh, uh, oh, I mean, you I have a question? Yeah, yeah, come no, no, just a commentary. Uh, for instance, in Colombia, we have a, a reparation system. It is administrative system and it is paid with our taxes <laughs> and uh, it is not important to their responsibility or liability because it is a statehood that it is the duty to reparate victims and it is independent of their judicial system and it repairs uh, individual and collective uh, it depends on uh, the community because we have uh, a lot of ethnic communities. Yep. So it depends on that. But we have um, in the paper a lot of advantage because it is a uh, compensation, rehabilitation, and we have a um, hybrid system to restitution, land, and property. Um, the one part is administrative and the other is judicial. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the central issue is uh, it costs a lot of money. You know? So we have a, a million victims. So, and what is the compensation for? Um, we have the Inter American Convention resource. Yeah? And the Inter-American Court uh, have developed uh, the five uh, measures, uh, rehabilitation, compensation, restitution. Yeah, but, but, question, it, it, yeah. but for what? For what acts? For acts by the states? For acts by the various groups? Um, for for all, 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 all
They don't care who did it. Yeah. During the time of the during conflict? The, during related, related, yeah. to the related to the conflict. It's related to the conflict. Yeah. But it's related after, to the conflict during the time. They don't ask. They don't want to put the blame. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise... Wow. Yeah. After 1985, yeah. is the, is the time yeah. until now, because we have right. now wow, really six uh, international conflicts. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 so, well, so yeah, it's a, new, uh, <laughs> it's a challenge, but we have uh, a mechanism, an administrative mechanism. If there's to, anything in English on that, I'd be yeah, really interested exactly, to read it. Uh, because you need to have a, a, a website yeah. in English with okay. in the system. Yeah. Can you share it? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Manu. Great.